Are you going to sing? Good morning. Thank you very much for joining us. This feels a little intimidating, but we are delighted that you have come to talk about a very important topic today. If we could have our first slide up here, we'll introduce our great panel and introduce our topics. I'm working with these great production folks upstairs, way up in the heavens, who just like angels are going to make magic happen, I hope. My name is Bill Silcock. I am the uh, assistant dean for global programs and research at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University. And today we're going to talk about teaching in a very unique way out in the field in the coverage of refugees. And I'm looking up here because I'm waiting for the slides to come up, guys. Oh, they're there. Well, I can't see them, but you can. Very good. Thank you. All right. So we uh, want to begin uh, this panel discussion in kind of a different way. And don't fret. We hope to go interactive before our 90 minutes are up and get your questions and your involvement in what we're doing. But what I would like to do is uh, introduce our panel and uh, to do that by asking a question. Uh, so the question that we want to ask them is... You see that there on the screen. So first of all, we have Tenna Parison, who is a full professor of television journalism and media production at the Faculty of Political Sciences at the University of Zagreb. For 30 years, she has been an active television journalist, a reporter, a manager. She's worked at HRT, Croatian's public television and radio. Since 2002, she's been teaching TV journalism, first as an adjunct and later as a full member of the university staff. Then, in 2012, she launched Student TV, which is the only student TV channel in the Balkan region, and she's been coordinating major innovative news projects at the University of Zagreb since then. Tena, welcome. What is the answer to this question? Grab the microphone right there so that they can hear you, and give us a, a warm hello and give us an answer to this question. Hello to everybody. <laughs> Okay, the interest for migrants and refugees is not big, I can see. That's how it is today in the society. And it's really a major question, and uh, we have to teach our students that it is a big issue. Okay, and next up we have Suzanne Fengler. She's a professor of international journalism at Dortmund University and the director of the Eric Brosch Institute for International Journalism at Dortmund. Major fields of her comparative research are media accountability, foreign coverage, and media and migration, which is timely for today's topic. She's directing several large-scale international projects funded by the EU, the German Foreign Office, the Volkswagen Foundation, the Robert Boss Foundation, and other major donors. Would you tackle that same question, Suzanne? And welcome. Good morning. Good morning, Bill. Good morning, everybody. And um, our um, major concern is that um, migration and refugees are covered at all because we are focusing on African countries and try to train African journalism educators and African uh, journalism students um, to, um, yeah, to, to tackle the subject. And if we look to sub-Saharan African countries, it's in, in many, many cases, it's not a topic at all. So all, our aim is to really make people aware of it. In the first case, sensitize them and qualify them for a better coverage. Thank you. Next up, we have Mary D'Ambrosio, who's the Assistant Professor of Professional Practice at Rutgers University. Uh, she's a former reporter for the Associated Press and Special Projects Editor for Global Finance Magazine. And she's reported extensively from Europe and Latin America. Her works appeared in the Huffington Post, Anthropology Now, the Institutional Investor, among others. And she's also been in the San Francisco Chronicle, Newsday, and the Miami Herald. Mary is now working on some very exciting and interesting projects to bring the human element to immigration stories. She's also working on a book about a family who helped to bring down communism in Albania. But Mary, let's focus today on this topic of refugees. What's the answer to our question? Bill, thanks a lot for inviting me and for organizing this panel. And hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Well, I think empathy is the thing that I'd like to focus on, to remembering to treat refugees and migrants as people and not just as part of a crisis or public policy problem. Because I think, as we know, as journalists and journalism professors, dehumanization is very dangerous. Um, it's not good journalism, and it can lead to atrocity. Thank you. That's powerful. And finally, we have 
Nicole Roman, who is the Head of Communications and Events Unit at the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights, FRA. By the way, if you're tweeting this session, the hashtag is EU Rights Agency, at EU Rights Agency. FRA's work on migration is extensive, focusing on fundamental rights concerns. It covers the legal, social, and policy issues as well as the situation at EU's external borders, where this story has literally uh, captured global headlines the last five or six years. On World Refugee Day this year, which was just a couple of weeks ago, June 20th, FRA launched an e-media toolkit on migration, and you'll hear about that later on in our session today. It's made by journalists for journalists and includes some case study examples that you can take right back to your classroom on how to cover migration the ethics of journalism, and the importance of knowing the law and fundamental rights. Welcome, Nicole. What's our answer to the question? Welcome. Good morning here in France. Bonjour. Um, of course, the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights doesn't teach. We are not an education um, agency. But key aspect in reporting on migrants and migration issues is a fact-based human stories, that's what I would say here for the moment, and not always looking at being in line with legal and policy um, given in the EU. Perfect. So the format for this teaching panel is we're going to um, talk a little bit, I'm going to talk for maybe five or six minutes, and then they'll share some key insights in a longer session, and then we'll come back to you for some questions at the end. But we're talking about teaching, and we're talking about teaching what uh, some scholars are calling Generation Z. There's lots of different names for them, but they're very much a new uh, definition of what the student that's going to be walking into the classrooms for us in the United States uh, in August or September. Here are some of the things, just look up on the list, that the students walking in, 17 or 18 year old, um, may not actually remember because they did not experience it. They were too young, all the way from the World Trade Center attacks to even a time before the European Union, which may or may not change in their, in their lifetime, depending on what happens with Brexit. These are some of the characteristics, and I think it's important because we don't want the students to get lost in what we're gonna talk about during this session. They won't get lost. You'll see how uh, teachers have engaged, like Mary and Tenna, and how scholars have done research, like Suzanne, and, and government agencies, uh, like Nicole represents, of doing some research on this. But these are the students that we're trying to reach, and to understanding what they're about, what their characteristics are, I think is really important for fine-tuning what we do in the pedagogy of teaching about this. There are lots of challenges in doing refugee reporting. This is a picture of some of the challenges that you face, just those of you who television production, it's typical gear challenges and working across international languages and sometimes border issues as you try to struggle through some of the problems. There are intense ethics issues. We just heard in the keynote address just uh, an hour ago a wonderful quote that we are in an era of new ethics with new tools. Well, there's still the old ethics that need to make sure that they stay alive uh, and vibrant in the kind of coverage that we are producing. Just last week, where I come from in the United States, uh, everyone was horrified and shocked with this picture, which was distributed globally by The Sun. Um, but shocking images like this of what happens in a refugee story sometimes fuel the power that is needed for citizens to act. And it's journalists' role to try to tell those stories in ways that do not offend or re-victimize the victim. It's ethical fine lines that we're really talking about here. How do you inform the viewer? Uh, how do you balance between too much coverage or too little coverage. Those are some of the challenges that we, that we wrestle with on a daily basis. Here is another picture of a refugee crisis coming from the 1990s. Is this a happy picture? It won a Pulitzer Prize. It's an interesting picture. It captures what's going on out there. But how do you guide your students in such a picture uh, in the editorial process of being the on-the-scene gatekeeper of that picture? There are so many voices, voice of our students, voices of the refugees, Voices of the bosses, if you're, if you're producing material for, you even paid material for a paid journalist site back home. You know, somebody back in a different place, far away from the field, might make editorial decisions very different from you. There are political implications when covering these stories. So sometimes when we are teaching the pedagogy of refugee reporting, 
We can't forget the politics about all of this. I know that extremely well coming from the United States where probably in the last hour something has happened to change on the migration issue in, in the United States. Um, I could not be up here without uh, giving you one quote from Walter Cronkite who is a famous uh, now deceased American television journalist, one time considered the most trusted man in America. And I think this is um, interesting because sometimes even in refugee stories, we were talking about this earlier, people get tired of these stories and, and they just they stop caring about them. And, you know, thank heavens, comedy has failed, although maybe memes are doing it, to enter into refugees. But I think we have to be very careful of not even letting our students or ourselves become cynical about what we are doing because as Cronkite says, citizen, cynicism deadens the approach a journalist should properly have towards any story. Finally, there's a little bit of irony, I think, talking about all of this in this building, former NATO headquarters. We are here in Paris. I think of World War II. I think of refugees that either are in this city even as we speak. I spent some time walking as probably you did, uh, around the beautiful university here and visiting the monuments and was amazed at this monument to war and then stopped and thought, where is the monument to humanity? Where is the monument to these refugees? Where is that? There's an American Western poet who has a line that says, some monuments move, but they're not all made out of marble and stone, that they are the living, breathing people that are part of these stories. And that's really what we're about today in trying to understand how to cover refugees, what are the opportunities, and what are the challenges. With that, I'll call up Tena from the University of uh, Zagreb. And I'm giving her the magic clicker. And then she's going to take it away. And upstairs, they're going to suddenly change slides. Yeah, OK. Hello, I am uh, supposed to give presentation for Generation Z, but you know, for the Generation Z, we can't go on Wi-Fi, and they were supposed to present you one uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful. I can say now wonderful because you can't see it, so it's it's fantastic uh, website. It's called Reporting Refugees, uh, www .reportingrefugees, together dot com that uh, we have produced uh, at my faculty, my students, students from the region in cooperation with Dr. Bill Silcock and uh, Walter Cronkite School of Journalism. And uh, this was happening uh, like three years ago. And uh, we were really trying to give voices to these people what just uh, Bill mentioned, because it's important to give voice to the people. So we did multimedia stories. It was a very interactive website about their journeys, about their dreams, the efforts to educate their children, uh, about volunteers and uh, but uh, also some conflicted voice of those uh, other journalists or reporters or media or politicians that uh, talk about refugees. And I think uh, besides uh, that each refugee had its name, uh, it was also important, especially in this section, uh, a voice to hear voices of uh, our students and their perception how it uh, changed uh, their perception towards uh, migration, towards refugee crisis, when they met someone and spent some time with them. Uh, so like we were doing text stories, infographics, maps, uh, GIFs, uh, all these wonderful uh, things that you are not seeing, but maybe if you will have time, you can you can uh, take an effort afterwards and look at the website. Uh, for example, uh, like we included many, many footage of the uh, people we interviewed, but also we, uh, we were visiting um, asylum centers, uh, we were visiting people who 
was stopped not only in Croatia, but in Serbia, Macedonia, Greece, because it was an international project uh, that we do, do, did together. Uh, we did, uh, for example, this is one of the interactive maps where we showed our journey, where we were meeting uh, migrants and refugees, and uh, we were giving their short statements in which uh, they were saying how they traveled, uh, what did they experience, and so on. Uh, these are just some screenshots uh, from the website. Here is uh, like interesting uh, on this uh, little photo, there is a picture, a photo of a little Picasso, so-called, that's a little, uh, one little boy that we found in Belgrade in the a refugee camp uh, who was drawing, who was so talented for drawing that I don't know at the moment what happened to him, but uh, he had exhibition, you know, in the, in the organized exhibition of his paintings and drawings in uh, Serbia. But there he told to our reporters that her biggest dream is to appear one day in the talent show in uh, United States. So that is really uh, his dream. So we, we were bringing there, something was in, uh, we used podcasts and uh, video stories and GIFs, if you see uh, here, I'm surprised that this is even moving, you know, so that's a big, big thing. So like, uh, <laughs> so you can see here our report, uh, uh, learning how to dance Afghanistani dance and there are some of, so we wanted in the section culture, wanted to bring something of their, of uh, their traditions, cultures uh, in the second, uh, um, on the second uh, picture you can see a guy showing a tattoo and there was a, a accompanying text which was uh, telling about uh, differences and symbols of the tattoos in Afghanistan. So, I mean, there were many, 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 many things like that. And uh, we produced actually two websites uh, along, our, because, uh, along our educational trip. One was at the beginning of the project and then one at the end when we collected all these stories from uh, Balkan regions, region. Uh, and then, you know, I must now make a little bre break before this uh, slide, because uh, uh, at that time we had access to people. It was so easy, actually, to get into the refugee camp, uh, to get permission, to talk to them, uh, uh, to come many, many more, more times and to contact our students, contacted them through Facebook and uh, arranged uh, uh, more visits and more interviews and more filmings. And uh, also I remember during the so-called refugee crisis uh, during, on Balkan route, uh, we could just, uh, they were crossing the borders from Croatia to Slovenia and then they were going to the promised land, Germany. And uh, like you could, you could come to them, you could give them food, you could give them water, you can, you know, like uh, it was so accessible. After closing the, the EU borders, because in the March uh, 2016, the borders closed and Germany said no more, no more refugees. And also I think the politics, uh, politics which uh, Bill also mentioned, a little bit influenced even the way of reporting and what we experienced that we couldn't even get access anymore so easily as before. It's not anymore so easy to get to the refugee camp and, uh, and talk to the, it's very hard to get permission to get to these places. You can only maybe find the people who are integrated but there are not so many who got to asylum and stayed in Croatia. Okay, there are, but uh, uh, mostly they're in the camps, you know, and they're waiting for their papers, papers to be fixed or to kind of during the night uh, 
ran away and uh, continue their journey in illegal ways. So like we even did uh, at our university uh, research and the narrative analysis uh, and we compared a reporting in 2015 and 2016 and uh, reporting in 2018 and 2019. And uh, you know, the language uh, drastically changed one of the things, as I put there, we don't use, we don't, our media don't use anymore the word refugees, but migrants is used. And also, uh, three years ago, the focus was more on the, on the humanitarian aspect of the crisis. They were, you know, like victims, and uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, pictures of women and children. And then, you know, the discourse uh, changed toward protection of state borders and uh, uh, like a fight against human trafficking. So migrants were portrayed only in that context. So they were only in the bad news in the article. And I'll tell more, you know, about these topics, smuggling migrants, illegal uh, migrants, uh, uh, but I, uh, accompanying this, uh, can, I, can we show the story now? This is only, we also did a lot of uh, TV stories and video stories, and they were just because this is the subject, how the reporting changed. I don't know how to run the story. We should run uh, at least. Yeah. Political science student Hussam Fadel escaped by boat and walked towards better future making Zagreb his new home. A lot has changed since then. Hussam tries to fit into Croatian society, although he frequently faces stereotypes. Kad kažem ja sam iz Iraka, ljudi misle da je ne znam, imam bombu sada sam. Ili ja sam terorist. Oni ne znaju da je Irak je 40 miliona. To je nemoguće da svi su teroristi. He blames the news media for society's perception of refugees, but also the politics. Svaki vlada ima utjecaj na mediju. Tako da sada vlada ima utjecaj na mediju da Hrvatska ne želi primiti izbjeglica, Hrvatska želi čuvati društvo, Hrvatska nije baš za takve stvari i tako dalje. A research by the Center for Peace Studies shows that news coverage of refugees changed in the last few years. In 2015, the news media were promoting solidarity and understanding. Tada i hrvatska javnost dosta pozitivno reagirala i bio je prisutan ta jedan jedna potreba za pomaganjem ljudima, jer su ljudi dosta se prisjetili one situacije koja se njima događala za vrijeme rata u Hrvatskoj. Ali eto kako je vrijeme odmicalo i kako se i sama granica zatvarala, to izvještavanje je postalo nešto negativnije, više sklono predrasudama i stereotipima i zapravo stvaranju neke negativne slike izbjeglice u hrvatskom društvu. At that time, the news media called them refugees, and now they label them migrants. Večernji list reporter Hassam Haidar Diab from Lebanon has been working in newsroom for 20 years. His experience shows there are ways in which journalists can avoid sensationalism while reporting. Čak u nekim situacijama sam bio i rasista i islamofobom i tako dalje, što mislim apsolutno paradoksalno i glupo, jer ja ne mogu biti rasista kak sam ja arap, ja ne mogu biti islamofob kak sam ja muslim. Ali biti, biti, biti neovisan, profesionalan novinar danas u Hrvatskoj, odnosno u Evropi, nije, 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 nije zahvalnost. Journalists often use phrases that can have long-term consequences. There is an ongoing debate among journalists and experts on which terms are optimal while reporting on refugee influx. Foreign policy journalists from Nova TV thinks their way of reporting is accurate. We have mentioned the refugees, ali u slučajevima kada je zaista se radilo o ogromnoj masi ljudi koja se našla na jednom mjestu, koja se kreće, mislim, pokušavamo malo nekad slikovito, figurativno publici, to je zgledateljima, prikazati stvari, čisto da ih zainteresiramo, ne sad iz nekakvih razloga. Sad ne bih rekao da to sad previše te ljude dehumanizira. 
in Center for Peace Studies, they disagree. Through their example, they try to put attention on inadequate phrases which are often used in reporting. One sensational human story was from Gorski Kota, titled Migrants on their way to West devastated Guslica. Even though migrants were accused of demolishing the Shebe building, it's actually an army complex abandoned 30 years ago and ruined because of old age. This is an example of clickbait, in which migrants are linked to vandalism and violence, even though there is no basis in fact. Media fuel discrimination didn't stop Hussam from trying to fit into Croatian society. Every day he attends the Croaticum course where he learns Croatian language and makes new friendships. I say that the language is the key for life, so that without the language you can't do anything in the society. I think that without the Croatian language you can't live here. So we have to learn the language. It's still uncertain if media and refugees can find common language deprived of prejudice and discrimination. But as Hassan's example shows, integration is a two-way process and both sides have to work on building mutual trust. Okay, thank you. We play the story. It's just one uh, because we... Uh, produced also the whole magazine on stereotyping and reporting, so that was one of the examples. And uh, so even in this story, we showed how the reporting changed from the, our first effort three years ago. And uh, now we have, again, refugee crisis, but it's reported much less. As you saw in the story, that archive footage, that was all uh, footage from, taken by, by our students. And now it's uh, uh, more difficult because uh, the borders with the EU, Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, border towards Croatia is closed and there are refugee camps uh, next to the border and uh, refugees are trying to cross to EU through in uh, illegal ways. So they're either trying to find uh, smugglers who will take them in the vans or, uh, uh, or you know, small buses in the groups who will take them through Croatia in during the night, or just uh, they are uh, trying to walk which is unbelievable. They were trying to walk during the winter all uh, because between uh, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina and Croatia, there are big mountains and they're quite snowy during the winter. And uh, so it's, it's really, but what is happening in the news is that we report only negative stories. So it's negative story about uh, a smuggling refugees or, you know, uh, migrants looting the houses on their way walking to the West. Also, there are Facebook groups uh, which are full of hate speech. For example, one example is the group where the migrants are seen, which where people are saying uh, police should beat them, uh, they should be, uh, you know, they should be taken to the mines and left there and terrible things uh, happening. And, uh, but uh, the most uh, stunning, besides these negative stories, is immediate silence. Only four days ago, a boat carrying 86 migrants from Libya sank in Mediterranean overnight and um, just three people survived. And some years, that news would be on the front page. Now it is hardly reported. And thank you. This is just the introduction to my other colleagues. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, um, good morning. And I would like to bring you some information from, from Germany, uh, where refugees and migrants, of course, have been a major topic ever since the so-called refugee crisis uh, started in 2015. And uh, even before we had started to, um, to, to mainly focus on migration from African countries, because we partner with um, African NGOs like the African Media Initiative, representing 2,000 independent African media outlets, and Africa Positive, which is an NGO based in Dortmund. And uh, so we decided from an, a very early moment on to tackle um, the issue of uh, coverage about Africa and from Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, so we found that interest in our work was uh, sharply rising in the context of the so-called refugee crisis. And I'm very glad here also to introduce to you Karina Zappe and Monika Lengauer, they sit here in the front uh, row, and they are my closest colleagues uh, in this project and would also be very happy to answer your questions. Um, afterwards, after the panel or, or in between. And uh, at the Erich Brost Institute at uh, TU Dortmund University, um, we have uh, developed um, a portfolio on, of, of activities in the field of migration and refugee coverage. And it's our basic goal really to, um, to sensitize um, African journalism educators and uh, journalism students from African countries for the very important topic of migration. Um, Tina has told us a lot about migra uh, migration and, and refugees uh, from, from the Middle and Near East, uh, which are coming through the Balkan routes. And um, so this is another focus which we like, would like to bring in and our partners uh, in this project are the German Foreign Office, Robert Bosch Foundation and the Volkswagen Foundation and we are very grateful for their support and I think this also shows uh, how major donors in, uh, in Germany are very concerned about a proper way to, to report on migrants and refugees. Um, we uh, try to base our training activities, which are very uh, central to us on research. So uh, we actually have started uh, with uh, comparative research on migration coverage. I will tell you a little bit more in a second. And um, uh, by doing re research, try to identify gaps because with a Eurocentric perspective, of course, we have a view what could be wrong or could be improved in, in other cultures, other continents, but is it really true and, and what are our own shortcomings and how can we compare it and how can we make sense out of it and really um, come to a better um, output in the end. So based upon research, which I will give you a glimpse into in a second, uh, we started to create networks, networks of journalism educators and institutes. So we created a network of um, sub-Saharan African uh, universities and journalism institutes, um, also building bridges between them and uh, also building bridges between African and European journalism educators and again journalists because we also think it's extremely important um, to start a dialogue between those two groups um, because also the experts um, um, do have some stereotypes or at least lacks black spots in their minds about migration and it's really our aim um, yeah to build bridges and uh, upon these research activities upon these network activities we have created training activities both aiming at journalists, mid-career journalists, and also um, at training educators um, yeah, to ingrain the, the concept of migration coverage, refugee coverage, um, more deeper into especially curricula in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, we also have a graduate school funded by Volkswagen Foundation where we are very um, grateful to be able to um, train seven PhD students uh, which focus on media development and uh, journalism in sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, we had a graduate school before and one of our former PhD students is now also a professor in, uh, in Ghana for, for journalism. And so we are very hopeful to train also a new generation of academics who can uh, bring in their expertise uh, later on. And here's also a, glim a brief glimpse uh, onto our network uh, we have created um, across African countries. And uh, two studies which have been conducted by our team in the past years uh, tried to identify uh, differences and similarities uh, in the coverage of migration 
um, on the one hand side between African countries and European countries. That was the first study we did and I will provide you a glimpse into it in a second. And um, the second study uh, is focusing on migration coverage in Eastern and Western Europe because you're very aware that we have a strong political clash between those parts of Europe in the way how to treat politically uh, refugees and migration. We also included uh, U the USA and, and Russia. And this uh, study is very recent and it's just coming out in a few weeks. Um, so just a little glimpse into the study comparing African and European coverage of um, migration. And you see here that uh, the volume of coverage is totally different, um, that um, over 80% of the articles we found uh, have been published in European media and only a, a very tiny fraction has been published in, in African media. And this, um, this reminds us that migration and, and refugees are not a big topic in, in the African public sphere, which is surprising because um, it's the big um, issue for many European countries. Uh, and so there's obviously a, a stark imbalance between the two continents. Also, if we look into Europe, we see that, um, uh, that European countries also treat the issue um, very differently. We can go into more detail maybe in the discussion. Um, and also, um, Tina mentioned the issue of um, security, base coverage about refugees and migration and we can very clearly also see this in our data that um, the majority of European countries uh, really treats migration and, and refugees um, in, in terms of national border, European border security and but if you look into the, um, into the African side we can see that um, uh, the African media really focus mostly on the spectacular boat catastrophes in the Mediterranean. Uh, and they also very much lack background. And um, obviously there's not enough, enough background that people can make a rational decision about migration to Europe, the dangers, the risks, um, the chances of success. So there's little debate about that issue in, in African media. And a short glimpse into our second study, focusing on the West and Eastern European way media treat um, migration. We have 17 countries involved in this study and um, also a very short overview. Um, you can see that two countries really stick out of the whole sample um, and these are Germany, um, which has been a major actor um, ever since the refugee crisis started, and Hungary is sticking out, and um, the, 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 the amount of articles appearing in Hungarian media is really dis disproportionate um, to all other European countries. And um, also, if you look into the way Hungarian media treat the topic, it also um, warns us again of stereotypes, because in Western Europe, we very often have a stereotype picture of Hungary and the way the Hungarian press, treats, politics, media, and so on. Um, but we studied two Hungarian media and, and their agenda is quite different. So there is actually independent coverage in, in Hungary um, and comprehensive coverage. And so also our views on other countries, in, even in Europe, um, should be questioned. <laughs> and also if we, another short glimpse into the way um, different uh, um, actors had their space in the coverage. And if you look at this, uh, this table, you see that governments were the main actors in, in the coverage across Europe. And um, look to the opposition, it's only 2%. So um, from our interpretation, <laughs> I would say there was too little room for critical debate reflected in media coverage. Um, the position the governments had um, was kind of taken over into, um, into media coverage, like the indexing uh, theory uh, reminds us of. And obviously there was too little political debate re reflected in media coverage. Maybe this is also a factor why people were kind of discontent with the outcome. And uh, of course you see also that um, mostly large groups of migrants were mentioned in the media, but individual migrants did not have that room to, um, to be portrayed in the media. Um, yeah, last two slides. Um, we try to change something. We organize high-level trainings for um, African and European journalists. The next one is coming up in September in Morocco. 
um, where we, as said before, try to build bridges, feed them with knowledge, um, and see how this knowledge is interpreted by um, the two different sides. Um, in, ma in many cases, many African journalists simply don't know um, how the dem demographic situation will change in Africa. Uh, we talked to, and the last time we did it in, in Senegal, many African journalists were simply not aware how the demographic development will change their continent and also the world's population and what impact this might have. So just sensitizing them for basic topics they need to know, uh, I think is very, very important. And uh, we are currently working on a model curriculum, uh, which is a 200 pages <laughs> convolute, uh, aiming really to, to, to provide um, basic knowledge on migration, migration reporting, professional challenges to migration reporting. So people across the world hopefully can work with this uh, curriculum and, um, and also base their uh, teaching uh, on this. Um, we will also conduct workshops for journalism educators to make them better um, stakeholders um, in, in the migration debate. And we, again, would like everybody to warmly, warmly welcome everybody to our up next conference in Dortmund in Germany in October. We will host the European Journalism Trainers Association Teachers Conference in uh, October 17, 18. And um, if you have time, you're warmly welcome. We will also have 12 distinguished African colleagues there and you would have the chance to meet them and yeah, be part of the exchange. Thank you. Hello, I'm Mary D'Ambrosio, Professor of Professional Practice at Rutgers University. Thank you all for coming, and thank you to Dr. Silcox for organizing this panel and inviting me. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about three projects I directed and organized in Italy and in Turkey, rather intersecting with the project that Bill and Tenna did interesting to me because some of the issues are the same and some are different, but the refugee issues uh, can be similar in that they intersect with the, the reporting in the Balkans. For about this first slide, for about five years, I directed a project in Istanbul in partnership with Istanbul's Bachir University with students from several universities, among them New York University, Northwestern, and Western Kentucky University. And while the focus was to teach international reporting rather than specifically on refugee coverage, of course, the arrival of millions of Syrian refugees at that time was the main story in Turkey. And so we and our students covered this story in Istanbul. Um, these are two shots that you see in the PowerPoint from a district in, in Istanbul called Emininu, which is a market district. And I think at this point in time, it was about 2014, and we were seeing, uh, you know, lots of people getting used to there being many, many refugees around, a refugee family uh, sitting at a fence, sort of huddling at a fence, and on the right, you can see people just walking by, a, a student, a kid playing with a doll. It was, I think, the Turks felt overwhelmed by so many refugees. It's different from the Croatian or the Italian situation in that there's a common religion. Uh, sometimes, you know, there's a common history, parts of Syria or part of the old Ottoman Empire. So there wasn't so much cultural rejection as there was um, feeling, you know, masses of people. There are 15 million people in greater Istanbul. It's already a big and congested city. And I think that Istanbul were thinking, you know, what are we going to do now? Um, So here's some of our coverage. We partnered with Bachir University, which is a large, a small English language, internationally oriented, what they call a foundation university in Istanbul. And the students in the journalism department there partnered with our students. Um, and so you can see on the slide in the upper uh, left, those students were reporting together. I think that these student partnerships were really excellent. Uh, because the students got to work with their peers, and I think as you did some similar things too, they really love this experience. Uh, they don't feel that their professors are telling them what to do. They can go out and, um, and work with people their own age. 
uh, the picture on the right is uh, from one of our students' stories. She went down with her team and reported from an area called Somali Street because there aren't just Syrian and Middle Eastern refugees in Istanbul. There are also many refugees from Sub-Saharan Africa. It is, I think as some of you know, today, today still a great way station for migration into Europe, raising some of the political issues that Bill talked about. One novelty of this particular project is that we tried to get the older students and the graduate students to publish their work in professional venues. This is a part of a project in which we um, paired students with professional publications and allowed them to intern as foreign correspondents. And the way that worked is the student would answer to an editor in another place, in New York or London or somewhere else in Europe, and we, the faculty, would help them execute this, their stories. These are two examples of stories that came out of that project. Alia Bochalchak was a French Algerian student studying at New York University, and uh, we brought her to Turkey, and she reported stories about how Syrian women were struggling to survive and to reconstitute their lives in Istanbul for Women's E! News, which is a women's affairs online publication based in New York, serious international issues publication. And she went on to write for them and to, and to um, you know, have a regular freelance outlet there. So we thought that was a great success of this project. The other story below is by a student named Hannah Tayson, and she wrote a story on Somali refugees in Istanbul for Interpress News Service, which some of you may be familiar with. It's a wire service focused on generating and circulating stories, focusing on the global south. Um, others appeared in other international publications. And I think that the internship idea is very popular among students because they see it as real world experience, whereas the professors are more associated with the lessons they learn at school, things they have to do. Uh, so we liked this project and we used it with more uh, experienced students and students who were ready, really ready for professional work. The project was a finalist for a US national Go Abroad Innovative Internship Award. This is an analytical association that looks at trends in study abroad. There we go. This is a different project, much simpler, about Syrian refugees in Rome. In this project, I took students to Italy for a one-week reporting trip as part of a course on covering Mediterranean affairs. This was in 2017. I met this family myself on the upper left, the Al Haranis, during a reporting trip to Rome of my own. And they were formerly from Homs, Syria. Their story was unusual in that they were brought to Rome uh, under the auspices of a humanitarian religious organization because the daughter had cancer of the eye. And so the mother, very savvy and English speaking, and now they're all fully Italian speaking, found out about this program, applied for it, and were, they were brought to Rome. What I liked about this reporting this story is it gave us an opportunity to talk to people as an, in, in ordinary circumstances. We weren't interviewing them on the ground or in the park or while they were in the middle of a big crowd of people. They were uh, being resettled in Rome. Uh, they had, you know, were a, sort of a path to residency, let's say, and we just invited them to dinner. If you look at the slide in the lower right, we invited them to dinner, and that's my student on the right interviewing uh, Jasmine Al Harani. Um, I would say a combination of, of English and Italian at dinner uh, for a story, and it was a more humanizing situation. And so this is the. Uh, oh, and they became celebrities. Sorry, those are screenshots, a little bit fuzzy. They met the Pope. They were interviewed on Italian TV. I found them independently, but they turned out to be very interesting um, people to feature. And this is my student's story. Um, published in our university, our, our department magazine called Kairos. And um, the, this is his clip. He's, my student, Roman Juras, his name is, is Ukrainian-American. And what I especially liked is his own realization, which I featured there at the bottom. Uh, it was truly an inspiration for me to tell the al Harani story as they embody the real people who have been affected by this humanitarian tragedy and dispel the many rumors about these refugees being uneducated, criminals, and even potential terrorists. I hope this story helps bring a consensus that these people still need our help as fellow humans and that they too can make a country great. So that was very gratifying for me as a professor. 
And thirdly, this is another project that we do now, and it's the descendant of the Istanbul project where we moved it to Bologna in about 2017 during a period when ISIS was growing more active in Istanbul. It seemed a little risky to have, especially undergraduates there, in an academic program. So we've run it three summers so far. And this is a screenshot of a web magazine we produced with our students during the first year. It was, again, a consortium of several universities, Northern Arizona um, University, uh, Rutgers, several other universities, and under the auspices at that point of an academic organization called IEI Media, which I worked for in summers for several years, and I believe we also have some faculty and some of my colleagues from that organization here. Um, some of the stories about migration we've been doing in Bologna, which is not a sort of A-list place that you would expect to do migration stories, but sometimes that's where you find uh, stories that are not being reported. Um, on the left, including rising homelessness, that um, African migration migrants in particular were contributing to a homelessness problem in a, a well-off city like Bologna. Um, I think well-off cities sometimes have the experience of attracting poorer people because they figure that's where the money is. If some of you live in uh, well-off districts of your cities, you may find a number of homeless people. I live in New York. We do that. Uh, we do find that. In Bologna, some similar things were happening. You'll see African migrants um, begging outside of supermarkets. Well, we turned that into a story, and we found that some people were actually not passing through, as we thought. They lived there in homeless shelter and in other, you know, sort of transitory, uh, trying to find a way to settle down sort of place, and often are begging outside of supermarkets, often English speakers, and that's their job. Another interesting story we did, the story on the right, is an integrative story focusing less on flows. Muslims fighting for a mosque. But I think, uh, you know, visiting Catholic countries as I have been in Europe this summer, you notice a dearth of mosques. Even in a progressive city like Bologna, the Muslim, small Muslim population found that it was hard to get permits. Really, the city administration didn't seem to want to give them the green light to to put up something that looked like a mosque. And so they were worshiping in parking lots and in storefronts. And to them, this was a significant uh, issue about being accepted and being integrated into the city and into the country. And of course, the larger issue in Italy was also a factor. And a third story we did there was um, uh, uh, Bologna is a strong LGBT uh, culture. And the, the LGBT groups there started Italy's first LGBT center for refugees. And we did a story about that. This was another case where I found student realizations from covering migration in Bologna was very illuminating for them and for us. Uh, the student on the right named Erin Byers wrote this reflection with her story. Um, and she, she's a young African-American student whose parents migrated themselves, I believe, from the Caribbean. She, and we're at a public university, so our students do not have too much money. They often ha have to put out quite a lot of money in fundraising to afford these projects in the first place. But they get here, and they discover that they're not at the bottom of the totem pole after all. And Erin Byers, the student on the right, wrote, uh, working on this story made me realize exactly how fortunate I am uh, not all young adults my age have access to higher education, secure home, or basic living needs. I'm a first-generation college student, and my parents themselves have had the experience of migrating to another country in efforts to find a better future, which they have provided for themselves. Not every immigration story is the same or easy. Sometimes, something people from any country must keep in mind before judging an immigrant. And finally, just a couple of takeaways, things that we learned along the way that you might find useful in organizing your own projects. I think one of the themes that we've talked about here is to avoid automatically painting migrants as the other, to encourage students to report on refugees and migrants as individuals, people like us, with the same dreams, flaws, and fears, but simply caught in different circumstances. I thought your website did a beautiful job of doing that. I found in my own reporting that migrants were not as focused on their journey as they were on what was going to happen to them after they got here. They were often very happy to have arrived in Europe, no matter what the circumstance, because they'd survived that horrible crossing, and not just the Mediterranean crossing, of course, but the crossings of the deserts in Africa, harrowing stories, as I'm sure some of you have already uh, read or know yourself from your own work. 
I think that it's good to use your diverse student body to build empathy. We've had in Turkey an Algerian French student studying in New York, Egyptian Americans studying in Texas, Peruvian Indians and Ukrainian Americans studying in Italy, and they instinctively understand the drivers and upheavals surrounding migration, sometimes better than their professors. Involve student interpreters from your host country. We've used a journalism department at Bachelor University. Um, we've used English departments in different places, and in in Bologna, we partner with uh, the University of Bologna's Department of Interpretation and Translation, which I have to say is like having pro interpreters. They're astonishingly good, and they also guide our students around, and they are interns with our program, so we're not allowed to pay them. We're just very grateful for them, but they, there are very good friendships that come out of these experiences, and lots of learning that comes on the margins, as we like to say, uh, uh, in international experiences. They visit each other sometimes, and they make friendships. Um, students typically consider work with student interpreters the best feature of their international reporting experience. I think it's good to find the story in advance. I was asked before how long these projects are. They range from one week to four weeks. It's not like a semester abroad or a year abroad. You often don't, the student often doesn't have time to find the story. So either I will find a story or our, uh, our fixers or program organizers on the ground will find the story and we have people to line up the interviews so that the students can come in, work with their interpreters, and begin interviewing right away. Um, this is a money saver for us too. Uh, we find that students often lack the time or ability to quickly seek out their own stories. If you're going for three months or something, okay, or maybe graduate students, but I find undergraduates need uh, that boost and you can help things along by getting it ready for them. Uh, we often work in teams in these projects. I believe we all do that for multimedia reasons, such as distributing uh, video uh, shooting, shooting tasks and audio gathering tasks and who's going to be the main interviewer. Sometimes these teams, our teams can be three to five people, even bigger. But I also think it's good to pair the more experienced with the least experienced students and groups. And I find this is really helpful in addressing shyness. Our students are, are from New Jersey, a state in the US mostly from New Jersey, and some of them have never traveled abroad before. So to leap from going to the school and the university of your state, maybe even living at home, to going abroad for the first time, and suddenly you're interviewing all kinds of different people in a foreign language can be intimidating, and it's helpful to be part of a group. And finally, I think it's good to automatically to avoid automatically adopting the framework and agenda of the public policy bureaucracy. As journalists, that's very tempting. We go out, we get reports, we listen to officials talk, but I would like to discourage academics from, from telling, having their students automatically label migrants and refugees and their arrivals as a crisis or a public problem, which is, in all honesty, one facet of the issue, but certainly in my view, not the whole issue and not even the majority part of the issue. I would argue that journalists are in a unique position to portray migrants as human beings exerting individual will in ways we supposedly so admire in the West. Thank you. Bonjour. Um, so what to say now? Once we've heard now we shouldn't look at public policy or legal issues. I'm from an EU agency, from the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights. And just to give a quick picture, of course we are not a news agency, we are not a teaching agency, but we do report continuously on migration issues. So I will present you a toolkit um, which, we, which was done by journalists and for journalists, but just ahead of it that you, if you don't know FRA, the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights, to let you know staff of our agency has been on the ground. So we've heard about the situation at the borders. We have had staff at the EU's external borders to actually guide border guards in respecting and protecting the fundamental rights of migrants coming into the EU. We've heard about terminology. I'll get back to that. Why do we talk about migrants? Um, we also had staff members in the so-called hotspots in Italy and Greece because of the situation there, guiding staff on how to fulfill and actually respect the fundamental rights of the people arriving in the EU. 
because as soon as you're on EU ground, this is now from a legal perspective, you have the same fundamental rights as EU citizens. And it is also about the dignity, which is a human right. So that just ahead of what I'm going to say now. The e-media toolkit, which we developed, um, has a history going back almost 10 years. Because 10 years ago, in 2007, the agency published a diversity toolkit for broadcasters, for European broadcasters. And this was developed to ensure accurate coverage of human stories. So I will focus on the human story aspect about um, communicating and reporting on, fund on migration. Just as a reminder, if you want to get background information, because of course the agency rather provides background information for you as journalists than really reporting on the ground as what we've heard in the previous examples. We have been reporting since September 2015 regularly and periodically on the situation, on the ground, on migration, what has been happening, looking at the countries who have, which have been most affected by migration issues. This year, these are quarterly bulletins. We call them quarterly bulletins on fundamental rights concerns on migration issues, which you find on our website, which is www.fra.europa.eu. Fra is F-R-A. Just ahead of the e-media toolkit. So what is the e-media toolkit? The e-media toolkit actually builds on um, the request from media agencies to develop a toolkit for journalists to avoid disinformation and correct reporting on various issues. So the overall objective to develop this toolkit did not necessarily come from a migration perspective, but it did come to avoid disinformation. What do journalists or teachers or trainers or educators or even NGOs, non-governmental organizations or national human rights bodies when they're communicating, what do they need to do in order to report raising emotions, but also remaining evidence-based, as we say in our jargon, which means based on facts. So we did um, develop this toolkit coming out in parallel also on a communicating rights project, where we actually defined 10 keys to effectively communicating human rights. You can find this brochure on our website as well. And I don't want to say that these 10 keys are particularly groundbreaking, and I assume a few of these keys, basic principles on how to communicate on human rights, fundamental rights, they're part of maybe your ground studies when you're studying journalism. But one of the first ones is tell a human story, and out of this, we have this e-media toolkit, which literally was requested um, to be developed by the European Broadcasting Union, the European Federation of Journalists and the Ethical Journalism Network. So they wanted us to help them share newsroom dilemmas when covering human stories. We took the request on board and developed an e-media toolkit. We adventured into an area as an EU agency which is not our core um, mission, I would say. We thought that since it's new generation, we are not going with a big paper folder to train journalists or to explain newsroom dilemmas. So we developed an e-learning toolkit. Here you can see the link of the e-learning toolkit. It was a new area for us as well to look into. And why, why did we do it? I already said it, request by media organization to actually develop such a toolkit and also to support them in their aim to ensure correct, uh, correct reporting and to support quality journalism. Because of course, as an EU agency defending um, the protection of fundamental rights, human rights in the EU, we want to have correct reporting. How? Well, we created partnerships with media organizations with, um, as I mentioned, with the European Broadcasting Union, with the um, International Fede European Federation of Journalists and also the International Federation of Journalists and the Ethical Journalism Network, which cooperated in de developing this um, media toolkit. It has three sections, e-learning, training and sharing. And what each 
newsroom dilemma is actually given in a course where you can look at which angle can you take when you start reporting on an issue. And there are seven case examples within the e-media e toolkit. Um, for training, we are about, it's not yet online, publishing a trainer's manual, which will, allow us act, which will allow trainers to look at the courses and then pull out their own way of teaching. I mean, we had several examples here of teaching, and it's not a curriculum, it's not 200 pages long, I can say it's relatively short, but it's in a way to um, provide information, what can you do to ensure that your reporting is really based on facts, but also in line with policy and legal issues as they are presented when reporting on migration issues in the EU. Part of the terminology change, which we have heard about earlier on, does come from there as well, because being a refugee has a specific legal meaning, and not everybody who comes into the EU is a refugee. Thus, slowly but surely, the terms have changed to migration. There are other political reasons behind it. I'm fully aware of it. On the other hand, I can say that FRA is really concerned that the use of terminology is not um, misusing what we would call the EU asylum aki, the, the legal framework within which we actually have to report on migration issues. How? I think I've gone ahead of um, what I wanted to say, but going how? So the e-learning toolkit is a platform on Moodle. Um, Moodle is used by many educational institutions and schools and also universities. So you might be far more familiar than, I'd say, white-haired older generations. But we did try to put it on Moodle, and it is on Moodle. It allows, it's a free en enrollment online, so everybody in this room can log on, can look at the case examples, can also exchange their experiences, their, their opinions, that is the part of the sharing, on the e-media toolkit. And what do we do? How do we actually ensure learning? I mean, when you're not there, when you're not teaching, you're not in a room, you cannot get questions and answers. We have included quizzes and interactive exercises which use gamification techniques. This, just to say it, it's a by note I want to say, was quite a challenging issue because of course, as an EU agency, we are under the new general data protection rules in the EU and some of these gamification techniques require particular privacy notice. Just to tell you that what seems so easily accessible, you want to put out their information on how to report on migration, how to report factful on migration while telling a human story, so giving the background information how you can do that and check whether those who are using these case examples can actually see whether um, they've learned something. It's a challenge to remain within the EU um, data protection rules, just as a by, by comment. So we have on this, um, in the learning part of the e-media toolkit, what is it? We have altogether seven examples with clear learning objectives. Just to say, we have example, example of topics will come, but there are examples from Agence France Presse, from the Financial Times, BBC Radio 4, France Télévision and Institut National Audiovisuel, Le Monde, The Guardian Twice, and Radio France Internationale. So there are seven examples with clear learning objectives. Just to point out three, the Agence France Pes is about human stories, ethical principles, and human rights. So this course introduces you to a news template that will enable you to analyze media reports according to the principle of ethical journalism. Without being directive, you learn as you go along. Then the Financial Times, it's about reporting on mixed movements of people. It actually examines the editorial challenges involved in balancing such principles as accuracy, impartiality, and humanity. I think you've heard all these things in your um, classrooms or university rooms or those who are educators. You have surely, fa surely faced those issues when you were teaching. Um, or Radio France Internationale on unaccompanied children. Here, the radio report analyzed shows 
how to tackle very complex stories by avoiding stereotypes and simplistic explanations, and by allowing different people to speak for themselves. We've heard it in the previous presentations to give what we as an EU agency would call victims, but to give people their own voice. In EU jargon, that is to give rights holders, because every person who comes to the EU has the same fundamental rights, as I said earlier, as everybody living here. So we would say rights holders have their rights and we try to give their voice, but them their voice. But of course, we need to be in that respect. Um, we need to avoid stereotypes, we need to avoid simplistic explanations for that, and we need to let them speak. To this, looking at these topics I just raised, the case examples give you actually four aspects. They look at the editorial challenges you may face when you try to balance principles such as accuracy, impartiality, and humanity. As I said, this is the um, Financial Times case example. They also show particular difficulties when you use or actually when you let children speak for themselves as reporters and sources for what you want to report on. They also illustrate the ethical dilemma you as a reporter or as an editor face, such as deciding, for example, when, you want, when do you need to conceal a person's face, identity, or when should you maybe just stop doing what you're doing as a journalist and help save someone's life. This is particularly um, illustrative in the Radio France Internationale example on unac unaccompanied children. And there is also this case example where it looks at the ethical journalist's duty in dealing with disinformation. Training, that's what I mentioned um, earlier. Coming back, just I will go back one slide. Um, Coming back to the last topic, this is, as I mentioned in the Radio France Internationale example, very clearly, because there you can see that the faces of the smugglers were blurred. So they're not identifiable. But the faces of the children, which showed despair, fear, screaming, um, they're not blurred. Why not? Because through telling this, their story, actually, you raise emotions. And most people remember stories far better when they have an emotional reaction to the story, to the human story. It's better remembered than just mere facts and statistics. So this is also the reason why we have chosen, in these case examples, stories about human beings, about people. So people actually remember better of what we, what we are talking about. And they will remember much better if we just give figures and statistics on, on these issues. But coming back to the children in the um, reportage de Radio France Internationale, you could say this is, you should have blurred their faces as well, but you would have taken out quite an emotional part of the entire story. And you can verify this yourself by going into the e-learning media toolkit and look at the case example them, the case example itself you will see that you have um, you will get emotional about it as well I think as journalists maybe even if you're used to remain very objective in front of incidents but it will show you that in making choices in the newsroom you actually influence the way on how you're going to report on migration Training, what? This is something to come. We have not yet, um, we will issue a trainer's manual in the e-learning toolkit in the next weeks, which will give you the opportunity to actually pull out examples of these case examples and then look at what specific topic you would like to train or teach in your universities or in your, in your classrooms. But it, it can also be used by a journalist or, for example, as I said earlier on, by non-governmental organizations and national human rights institutions 
for their own communications department, training themselves on how to report on migration. In the future, we plan to have webinars. This is, I'd say, this is in the planning, it's in the future, but it is not yet um, severely established. I can't say it'll come in October. It will most likely develop over time. What we have seen over the past two weeks, because the e-learning toolkit has, was launched on World Refugee Day on the 20th of June, we have over 160 journalists already registered on the toolkit who started to communicate with each other, who started to actually ask questions to the others about the case examples which, have, which they have seen. And that is one part of the sharing aspect of our e-learning media toolkit, which we would like to favor in, in the future, that there is actually an exchange going on between those who are looking at the case examples, because as we all know, we generally learn much better from our peers than we do when we look into a school book or when we look just at a website on our own. So sharing, what? There is the opportunity, as I just said, for forums. Some exercises um, with the course material, material give the user the option to discuss with others and raise questions. Then there is the opportunity to give feedback on the e-learning media toolkit with the overall objective that maybe at some point you yourself who have invested into some of the course learning to actually become a course leader yourself by proposing a course on migration reporting in that media toolkit. And as I said, there's download, um, there's the opportunity to download material for classroom learning. So this is the link, e-learning, e-learning.fra.europa.eu. And there are many, I, I suggest you have a look into it. It's very difficult just in a presentation to raise um, all the aspects you can find. What I can say is we've presented the toolkit at the European Broadcasting Union in, in Geneva with journalists who are actively reporting on migration issues. And the most astonishing part was they all stumbled over the very first quiz question, which was about facts. And migration reporting, what I can say from an EU agency perspective, it needs to be based on facts, which should not hinder that you have a true human story to tell and that you actually have calls for action coming out of it. I will give you an example of what we have done ourselves to just communicate, though we are not a news agency, as I said, um, to communicate on severe labor exploitation on the social media. It's a very short clip, which I would like to, the technicians to show in a second when I finished my sentence, just to show you what we pulled out of a 120 page research report to actually report on a fact and try to raise emotions. There's a longer clip available on our website as well, which also shows the people who are affected, who came into Italy and you were severely exploited um, in the agricultural sector. Could you please show the very short video clip now? It was the last item in the collection. The, okay, it's about severe labor exploitation, which takes place in, your, in the European Union and you would not have thought that this happens. There's no sound. Does it not work? What a shame. It was a very short clip just showing how we communicate on uh, migration issues. But apparently it doesn't work. Apologies for this. If we, get, if we get a high sign, we will definitely play that. We've got about six minutes left before we're done here. First of all, thank you for staying with us. Do you know what you've experienced over the last 90 minutes? 
and Sahid is risen in this room. Can you imagine what it would be like to be on a boat, crowded, hot, hungry, cold, tired? You have just, in the 90 minutes of what is, you know, from a Western perspective, a little bit of uncomfortableness, touch the surface of what these refugees have gone through. And so as we have heard from each of these panelists today, both from the expertise of heavy research coming out of, out of Germany and out of Croatia, actual on the ground reporting that, that Tena and Mary have talked about, and this last experience that Nicole has shared with us about really putting into our hands how to be better educators and better journalists in trying to cover this very complex story. Do we have the video? Just interrupt me if it suddenly magically appears. Um, one of the things that was shared during our opening address was a very powerful quote. Truth has to be produced to be protected. And as we sit here in Paris over the next three days and are in this incredible historical city, uh, one of my good colleagues, Professor Dale Cressman of Brigham Young University, told me about a wonderful bar. I don't think Mormons drink much at bars, but he knew about this bar called The Scribe, where during World War II, journalists would hang out. And so here we are just in a half hour going to head down to lunch and have a chance to hang out as journalism educators and try to wrestle with some of these questions, how we can actually make and help our students have powerful pedagogical experiences, but do it in such a way that we're protecting the innocents, but telling their very important story to the world. I'm going to give each of the panelists are going to pick up the microphone and give us one final thought, and then we will be done. We'll start with Tena from Croatia, if you'll grab the microphone. She's not taking the cue very well. <laughs> Just one final thought. You've got 30 seconds. One final thought. And I if want the video to see a video. If the video clip comes, the good folks upstairs in the heavens <laughs> will play it for us. This was my final word. <laughs> You, you've done this work for at least seven, eight years. What's been, what, why do you keep doing it? I think it's very interesting, but that's, uh, I think that uh, we shall face even more challenges. And I think, you know, in the years to come, because uh, this silence, media silence is a little bit worrying me. Thank you. That was, that was very powerful. And I think we've got the kit. Play the kit again. We, if you've got the full audio, I'll shut up. We'll play it. Thank you, Nicole, for the great work your organization does. Tana, not to lose your thought, media silence. What can media. we do as educators to stop the silence? Yeah, we have to stop the silence because this media silence is worrying me and we have to find the ways to make audience interested again. Perfect. Suzanne, thank you for bringing the perspective to this audience because we represent, sadly, you know, a very Euro-Western perspective, but your institution and your university is down in Africa, and there's, you know, incredible refugee crisis in South Asia, even as we speak, in, in Myanmar with the Rohingya refugees, et cetera, but your final thoughts. Um, I would like to make people um, more skeptical of any normative approach to migration reporting. We need to have a comprehensive um, reporting which includes all stakeholders in the debate, and that is a broad range of people. And also I would be happy if, um, if we have more knowledge about the people, uh, about the countries refugees and migrants come from. This is a very weak spot in migration and refugee coverage um, for a better assessment. Um, we need to know what's going on in, in, in the countries and need to differentiate between the countries. Um, and also need to start a discussion, what can we really seriously do to improve conditions in the countries people migrate from? Because um, this will probably help people as much if we have a frank and honest discussion about this as well, and also about the shortcomings of, of development aid. Um, 
to make life better for many people and maybe also stop them risking their lives in the Mediterranean. Thank you. Mary. Well, <clears throat> there may be media silence on this issue right now, as Tana says, but the issue of migration is here to stay. And I think that we are not going to stop covering it. I think we're going to increase our coverage with 65 million people on the move internationally and probably will rise because social media is also driving some of these um, movements as well as um, climate change, war, and economic um, deprivation. So I think these are great stories for students to cover in university. You give them exposure to different kinds of people in a way that you can't back home while contributing to reporting that might not always be done in major media. We can supply this at the university level. So I hope we keep doing these projects. Um, Fra will of course continue to report on migration issues and they are to stay. I can only follow up of what Mary just said. It will not finish by tomorrow. Linked to it, however, and that is um, a critical aspect to, at which we are looking, is the security. Because this has, in several aspects, become one of the major issues. How can we protect ourselves? But how can we protect ourselves without excluding? Because this is, I think, the key question. Without excluding and disrespecting the human dignity and also the fundamental rights of others. Thank you very much, Nicole, Mary, Suzanne, and Tana. Would you give them a round of applause? <laughs> Our special thanks to Professor Ken Fisher from the Gaylord School for helping behind the scenes. And thank you all for being with us. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but that doesn't mean the questions will not get answered. Just come on up and ask them. And thank you very much for being with us today.